This is Public Resource. We've been talking about things that are internet things, tech things. Things like the right to fix, the right to make, the right to make APIs, the right to encrypt, the right to reverse engineer the public domain, universal access to an open and decentralized internet, universal access to human knowledge. But you might rightly ask, are there not more serious problems facing us today? I mean, really, a global climate crisis that we ignore while we blithely continue to destroy our planet a raging pandemic and unequal distribution of patented vaccines developed with public funds on top of what was already an existing epidemic of famine and disease. The poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting obscenely richer. It isn't a gap anymore. It's a canyon, an uncrossable chasm. Our economy is structurally unfair. Our systems of justice all over the world have become ever more unjust. We sell, we deny, we delay access to right and justice. Housing is inaccessible and inadequate, and public transit is crumbling, but private equity is getting fat on buying up and milking mobile home parks and private prisons and usurious loan brokers. Fascism and delusional misinformation spread like wildfires. Our electoral processes are commandeered by the rich and the crazy and by autocrats and fascists. Who cares about access to knowledge in this world, in this litany of horrors and calamities that demand our attention? Should we not work instead on stuff that matters? I put it to you that access to knowledge is absolutely necessary. It is necessary, but it is not sufficient but it is something we must do. Democracy depends on an informed citizenry. John Adams insisted we must let every sluice of knowledge be set aflowing, for only then will our rulers become our public servants. Economic opportunity, access to the essential human utilities of water and gas, and electricity and internet, Housing for all, these are things that can only happen when we build a fair and just society. A society not built for Ayn Rand toting money-hungry speculators and seekers of arbitrage and rent. To change the world, we must know the world. We must educate ourselves and our neighbors. We must seize the reins. This is not easy. Martin Luther King taught us that justice and change don't come rolling in on the wheels of inevitability. They come only with continuous struggle. Dr. King called for us to escape the dark and desolate valley of injustice, for us to straighten that crooked path, to climb together this road to a shining city on the hill. Access to knowledge is one of those paths we can walk on. Today, Scientists are the new indigo farmers, forced to beg for financing, forced to ship their work off to foreign corporations, buying back high-priced finished goods only from the company store. Scientific knowledge has become colonized. Librarians are told they can't loan books to people. They are told that as a condition for opening the sluices of knowledge to their patrons, they must spy on them, or they will be denied licenses from private equity-funded poachers who claim they are the purported owners of our public domain. Lawyers and citizens are told that our laws are proprietary and may only be accessed under the strictest conditions and at the dearest of prices. Even the most critical public safety information, fire codes and COVID vaccines are copyrighted and patented, designed to extract rents from the well-to-do walled off from those without means, abandoning any sense of public purpose, abandoning public good for private gain. Computer users are told they can't fix their computers. Farmers are told they can't fix their tractors. The details of your life, your every move, have become products commoditized by big tech and big data. Knowledge has become commoditized. Information has become chickenized and privatized. But this world is not inevitable. Leo Tolstoy was fascinated by the Sermon on the Mount. He embraced it to become a better anarchist when Jesus stood on the mountain of Beatitudes. He taught love and nonviolence, lessons that inspired Tolstoy 
and put him on a path to learn how to resist and question authority using those tools. A young lawyer in London, Mohandas K. Gandhi, was in turn inspired by Tolstoy to take that same path of nonviolent resistance of loving thy enemy. Gandhiji became especially entranced by the idea that was presented that day in that sermon on that mountain, the idea of bread labor that by the sweat of thy brow shalt thou earn thy bread. To Gandhi, this meant that one must do labor every day. One must do manual labor, turning grain into bread through manual labor. Or perhaps in the modern parable of Thomas the Brewer, turning grain into beer and sending it to the Smithsonian as an act of love. But it wasn't bread. And it's certainly not beer that Gandhi G made. Think of the iconic images of Gandhi at his spinning wheel, making thread, urging everybody else to make thread, to make that thread into whole cloth, into khadi, so that India could break the oppressive chain of commerce and servitude where India shipped cotton off to England and bought back high-priced finished cloth from the mills of Manchester. Bread labor. Bread labor with a purpose was to Gandhi how India could become self-sufficient, how India could become free. What you may not know was that Gandhi's first bread labor at his ashram in South Africa was not spinning thread. It was typesetting. Everybody at the Phoenix ashram had to do manual labor every day, and running the printing press was their bread labor. Gandhi wasn't very good at typesetting, but he put in the effort— and of course, he was an amazing editor and a writer for the ages. That printing press, in turn, disseminated knowledge throughout the Indian diaspora in South Africa, teaching them about self-reliance and their rights and the path they must take nonviolently to better their world, to change their world. That bread labor changed the world. It was the beginning of decolonization. In addition to bread labor, Gandhi preached the importance of public work, doing work that benefits your community. Typesetting or spinning were not just hobbies, ways to pass the time. They were a way to set that crooked path straight, to climb to that shining city on the hill. I put it to you that we must embrace bread labor. We must embrace public work. You might be a librarian teaching your patrons the arts and crafts of finding and using knowledge. You might be a coder, making open source software on which we can build a better, more open internet. You might be a scanner, transforming and preserving knowledge for all to access freely in the belief that scanning is the new spinning. But no matter what you do, you've got to serve somebody. You've got to serve the public domain. You've got to do public work. We must all be public servants. Universal access to knowledge is the great promise of our times, but we must all do our part if we are to build this public park for our global village. Who may swim in the ocean of knowledge? Who may stand on the shoulders of giants? Who will fling open the gates to the walled gardens? Who will man the ramparts and seize the means of computation? May it be all of us. Let us be the change we wish to see.